Hello, I'm Adam from Well Played, and I recently had the amazing opportunity to sit down and speak with Mark Mir ahead of his appearance at PAX Oz later this year. As the acclaimed voice of male Commander Shepard from the Mass Effect trilogy, and lover of tabletop RPGs from Dungeons & Dragons right through to Call of Cthulhu, Mark has many insights and stories to share from throughout his illustrious career. I had an excellent chat with Mark, and we here at Well Played are very thankful that he took the time out of his busy schedule to have a sit down with us. Have a look. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to have a chat with me. I really greatly appreciate that. And I was looking forward to seeing all of your wonderful bits and pieces behind you. I've seen a couple of your other interviews oh. and your <laughs> your RPG uh, appearances. And yeah, you've got quite the, the collection behind you. What's kind of the... I do. What's the standout piece for you? I'd, I'd, for me, hmm. it's definitely on the, the left-hand side, maybe the more Lord of the Rings oriented ones. But what, what stands out like, to you the most from your collection? I do have a number of Lord of the Rings weapons uh, on the wall, including uh, that Morgul blade, which I actually managed to get at uh, Weta Workshop itself uh, when I was in New Zealand in 2018. So, yes, those are all. But I would say the crown jewel is probably the handmade Necronomicon that I've got in the... Uh, well, hold on. I can show it to you. That would definitely do it. I'm just reading a few of um, Lovecraft's stories at the moment. So that certainly speaks to me. Here we are. So uh, this I actually got as a uh, 10th anniversary gift for my wife. Uh, we were married on Halloween, so apropos. Uh, this was made by an artist by the name of Jason McKittrick, and it was actually used in an off-Broadway production of an adaptation of The Hound, which is a Lovecraft story. Amazing. Uh, and, uh, and of course, they could have... Uh, simply done the pages that it was meant to be open to, but he actually did the entire book. So it's pretty great. Good it's Lord. a very nice prop. Yeah, that yes. is fantastic. In Latin. In oh, Latin naturally. Almost. Which, yes. I mean, you can just kick back and, and flick through and read just whenever you like, of course. Of course. I don't yeah. read Latin myself, and I suspect it's probably just stuff about aqueducts. Who knows? But it, yes, yeah, I, that yeah. is probably my favorite piece. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, Right, well, I'll... Now, I, 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 should, I should kick off with a, a video game or board game related question, but where you are in the world, are you a hockey fan or are you just having to deal with all of the crazy hockey fans that have kind of descended upon Edmonton at the moment? I'm afraid I'm a classic nerd. Uh, so uh, yep. comic books and horror movies and uh, role-playing games and video games, those are the sort of things I'm interested in. Uh, sports has never really been something that held my attention. Uh, but, you know, you live in Canada and by osmosis, you know a few things about hockey. Hockey, so I yep. certainly wish the Oilers the best. Uh, I think if they don't win tonight, it's all over. So yeah, they're uh, in a bit of a tough spot. But um, mm -hmm. I mean, the sooner it's over, the sooner you probably have your city back from from the the, the orange wave <laughs> that's probably descended upon it. So it's probably not a completely bad thing. I, I think it's probably fairly good for the local economy. So I won't complain. Absolutely. But getting on to what probably everyone who is listening to this would actually care about. Um, your career has obviously spanned across a great many series, but you're probably most well known for the voice of Commander Shepard. Throughout the Mass Effect trilogy, players can either take the heroic approach and they can go Paragon, or they can be a bit of a space bastard and go Renegade. How did you find the process of finding the different voice for the same character, just on differing sides of the morality scale? Well, of course, that was a challenge that both Jennifer Hale and I, who plays mm. the female Commander Shepard, uh, that was a challenge that we both faced because uh, very few people will tend to play pure Paragon or pure Renegade. They're going to be making choices from either sure. side. Uh, in the recording process, we would tend to go through and record the entire Renegade path or the entire Paragon path first in a given scene, then go back and do the other path. Uh, however... Uh, one thing that we really had to watch out for was uh, having wild mood swings if someone was going back and forth in between. So uh, a couple of times, yeah, we did have to re-record scenes because it was like, uh, no, you got to even that out because the Renegade and the Paragon sound too different. You have to make it so that someone could theoretically choose a Renegade line, then choose a Paragon line for the next response sure. without, without there being, a uh, again, a wild mood swing. A massive tonal shift. Like, yeah, I can imagine that would be would be hard once you get into one mindset to to then have to flick to the other. Um, is it something 
that you would be happy to revisit that sort of recording style or was it a bit of an arduous task and you prefer to maybe stick to something a little more linear, I suppose? Uh, no, not at all. It was, it, I mean, let's face it, we do get paid by the hour generally. So the more dialogue <laughs> there is, it, True. the more we'll be in the booth. Uh, so uh, I was certainly up for the challenge and uh, it was a real, uh, I mean, a real honor to get to blaze the trail as it were, because Shepard was one of the first fully voiced protagonists in an RPG. Uh, and uh, while it is maybe an easier job if you're playing like, you know, a villain NPC or a side character mm -hmm. or something like that, who only has one emotional path or at least, you know, they have a set character as opposed to a character like Shepard, which is entirely molded by player choice. Because Shepard could be anything from a complete Boy Scout to a borderline psychopath, still saving the galaxy, sure, but of not course. being very nice about it. So, uh, so yeah, that that was a challenge early in the process. We sort of came up with what is the core of Shepard, whether Renegade or Paragon, and that is a military officer who's used to giving orders under pressure and uh, and maybe not showing necessarily that much emotion in a given scene. So that sure. does help justify the you know the 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 path that we're taking uh in terms of not having wild mood swings yeah of course absolutely and in in that process um pardon my ignorance for the the uh the voice recording i i have no idea how it works of course i've never done it myself um what kind of context are you given for these scenes? Are we talking like sort of a, a movie script or kind of a, can we get that with a little more anger next time? Cause particularly the, the one that stands out for me, if you didn't have context would be uh, the reporter that it just kind of goes from zero to a hundred and you end up hitting her in the face if giving a, 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 a paragon reading that you just kind of you know, oh, yes. knock her on her ass, which I understand you're good friends with the, the voice actor who, who did those lines as well, which is, all the more hilarious. Yes, yes. A April Bannigan uh, and her brother Jacob Bannigan uh, was my best man at my wedding. So yes, we've Amazing. known each other for many years, <laughs> and uh, yes, we've uh, we've certainly uh, had fun with uh, the relationship that Shepard and uh, Kalisa Algelani have uh, in the video game. Uh, now, okay, wait, wait. What was the initial question? It wasn't just do you know April Bannigan? It yes, was, um, were... co context for your for your lines, right? So in in. Uh, in all of our recording sessions, of course, our directors were invaluable for giving us context. So I worked up here, and I did most of my recording up here in Edmonton. So I worked mm -hmm. with uh, Shauna Perry on the first game, and then Caroline Livingstone, uh, and then later uh, uh, Suzanne Hunka a bit on the third game. Uh, and the, they were the ones that gave us context, as in, this is what's happening in this situation, here's where we are in the greater narrative. And sometimes we would also be provided, especially in scenes with lots of action or where you needed to really figure out where the characters were in the space that the scene was occurring in. Mm. Uh, for example, if like, oh, you're actually shouting over a chasm here, or you know, you're in a giant sure. warehouse and there, you know, there's some boxes in between you and there's a group on the other side that you're speaking to. Uh, so on occasion, we would be given uh, very simple animatics uh, to look mm -hmm. at scenes, uh, especially again, especially scenes with lots of action or where there was like going to be explosions or what have you that we have to speak over. Uh, and they would show us that. And often, when I say simple automatics, it was like, often it was just like, you know, an orange rectangle to show you where the various <laughs> characters, like, sure. you know, that's you, these blue rectangles are the other guys, and here's a rough look at the room yep. that you're in. Uh, so, so yes, uh, as I say, the our context came to us uh, through our directors, and they were invaluable. Absolutely. Um, I have to ask, have you ever received a discount for endorsing something as Shepard? Because I know that Shepard is definitely not adverse to endorsing seemingly whatever he's asked to for a discount. Oh, is, yes. Has that something I that mean, has come in handy for you? Uh, you know, in the spirit of that joke, of course, I am always willing to endorse whatever <laughs> as Commander Shepard. It's like, it, it would be, it would be against the spirit of the entire thing. If I, it was like, <laughs> no, I won't endorse that. Uh, and certainly at conventions and things like that, I've, I've recorded, you know, and, and fans have just had me record, you know, this is my favorite, Telephone voice message on the Citadel, that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, 
And and of course, at conventions, sometimes they do, you know, it's just like, here, here's something from our booth for saying that, that our booth is your favorite booth on the Citadel. And, you know, that's always appreciated because, as you can see, I'm a nerd and a collector myself. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, you can never do with uh, enough stuff. I definitely agree with that. Mm -hmm. I've, I, I attest to that behind me also. Um, speaking of particular voice lines across the trilogy, is there a, a voice line or a few voice lines that stick out to you as your favorites? I know that... Uh, I should go kind of is a, a line that has stuck out to a lot of the, the Mass Effect fans. But what about yourself? I, Are there any lines? I mean, I, I do like that one in particular because it was in no way intended to be ca Commander <laughs> Shepard's catchphrase. But Jennifer and I said it enough times that it's just, you know, force of repetition. That's what that is the de facto catchphrase. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> so, you know, writing just I should go on, on people's merch and, and things like that. <laughs> and stuff. But yeah, that's fun. Uh, let's see. There's also, I mean... There's a line that's not actually in the games that I write on uh, fan stuff as much as I write anything that was actually in the games, and that is Will Bang, okay? Ah, which is of from, course. Which is from the Manslayer uh, uh, YouTube videos. I was a fan of Manslayer like back in the Skyrim days when when that's what he was doing, and so Amazing. I was very excited when uh, <laughs> when somebody told me he's like, oh, Manslayer did a Mass Effect one. So yeah, I was I was always delighted to see those, and certainly as I say. Probably second after I should go, will bang okay is what I what I end up writing on things. But there are, I mean, there are a lot of great lines from those games. Um, let's see, favorite renegade line. Hmm. Uh, that was for Thane, you son of a bitch. That one's a popular one. Good. Uh, also, a relinquish one bullet. Where do you want it? That's from a scene where I think you know people are trying to divest them of their weapons and hand in their weapons before uh, before something happens. Uh, what else? Uh, I mean, there is the final line of the Citadel DLC, uh, which is you know it's a hell of a ride, a eh, Shepherd, and Shepherd just responds the best, and that was literally the final line uh. that I recorded in everything that I ever did for Mass Effect. So like that was that was a nice way. To yeah, that's. To that's lovely. Uh, and, and the Citadel pointed. DLC itself like, had a lot of killer lines and, uh, and you know, poignant lines, but also like hilarious lines, like the, you know, the, making the joke about I should go in the Citadel DLC yes. when they're locked inside the vault and lots of, lots of great stuff. So yeah, hard, it's hard to pick when there are literally tens of thousands of lines that I said. Yeah, there are a ridiculous amount to choose from, and I'm sure that fans come up to you and throw you just obscure lines that, you know, amongst the thousands and thousands you've probably completely forgotten about, but that's the, the usually of fandom. When, yeah, usually when it, like, you know, I don't necessarily have an encyclopedic knowledge of every yeah. line that was spoken in Mass Effect, but you, when they, you know, they remind me of the line, I'm like, oh, that was when, you know, so it'll, it'll come back to me often. Speaking of which, the original game released in 2007 and then Mass Effect mm -hmm. 3 wrapped everything up in 2012, but the games are still played, loved in an insane way right up until today, which is, you know, over 10 years later since it was all wrapped up. Mm -hmm. What do you think gives the series such incredible staying power and why do you think it resonated with so many people? Well, Bioware did such a great job in you know, just creating the world. I mean, if you mm -hmm. wanted to, you could spend your entire Mass Effect experience just reading codex entries. And mm -hmm. <laughs> there are, it, again, so fully fleshed out. Uh, I have the advantage of being uh, in on it from, you know, even before the recording process, like yeah. literally on the ground floor because uh, before I was cast as Commander Shepard, I was brought in when th everything was still in the concept art stage and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, narrative had not been nailed down. Uh, I was brought in to essentially do a presentation on what the what a typical member of every alien race might sound like. And, right. Yeah, and and again, this was like just at the spitballing stage, so it's like maybe sure. like this, how you like that, you know. And some <laughs> of the my suggestions they took, and they like you know, I'm the reason that the Solarians all kind of speak with the cadence of Steve Buscemi, and uh, <laughs> they, I won't be able uh, to say that now. Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. In fact, yeah, that was the very, I think the very first thing that I laid down was like a Solarian bartender. Uh, and, you know, he was, you know, had that sort of clipped specifically Steve Buscemi in Reservoir Dogs, you know, as Mr. Pink, that sort of right. <laughs> clip dialogue. Uh, that I'm the reason, you know, why the Vola, I mean, it's, you know, it wasn't rocket science. I was like, these guys sure. wear these 
sort of mask apparatus. They should have a wheezing sound in between everything they say. And, you know, so the, for the bolus, uh, something, again, very obvious that the Krogan should probably be big and gruff and have deep voices. Uh, sure. And there was some some stuff that I'd suggested that uh, just didn't end up uh, being followed because of other practical concerns. Uh, okay. The um, Turians, uh, specifically, mm. Because of the structure of their mouth, I'd, I'd pitched that maybe they have a little clicking sound when they talk or like at the ends of sentences or things like that. Sure. And uh, uh, got, this was before Garrus was going to be a main character in the game. Uh, and so it was sort of decided that uh, yeah, that's going to get old very quickly uh, because we have a yeah. Turian who talks a lot. <laughs> so uh, so they ended up just going with a filter for, for that uh, and sure. for all Turians, really. Uh, but there were some alien races that I got to, you know, in the game, I got to play most of, uh, for example, anytime you see a Vorcha, it's me, I'm all of the Vorcha and <sighs> I think I'm most of the Hanar as well. So sure. Yeah. Doing including, the... including Blasto, of course, which naturally is, you know, in some ways, my favorite character, you know, no offense, Shepard, but <laughs> <laughs> nah, he's fantastic. I'd imagine doing the Vorcha voices. Do you kind of have to do that at the end of the 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 d end yes, of your days we because were, i feel like we that's pretty that. taxing <laughs> yeah we would usually do that any vorcha stuff at the end of the week to give yep. my voice a whole weekend to recover uh because Good. there was no particular technique i was i was just screeching as loud as i could with like <laughs> uh, and i had a, a mouth half full of water usually when i was doing the oh vorcha. that checks out yeah absolutely yeah. <laughs> uh and so they got me to lay down the first Vorcha and I, you know, I, I did a variety of things, uh, but you know, what we ended up with is, was one of the takes that I did. Uh, and then they decided, yes, we do want you to play that Vorcha. And in fact, we might get you to play every Vorcha because, uh, <laughs> How was it put to me? We don't want to have to ask other actors to do that to themselves and you seem willing to. So. <laughs> yeah. I can imagine the, um, the explanation of, okay, so we need you to do this take, but can you just take this glass of water, gargle mm -hmm. that and then scream? Like, yeah, I, yes. I can, I can see why maybe they didn't want to maybe throw that at someone else. So that's mm -hmm. yeah, completely fair enough. Um, now you are a frequent collaborator with Bioware, particularly, you know, they're, they're local to you, which must've been fantastic, especially when you, you know, you're needing to do the voice work so often, but they do have a game coming up in Dragon Age, The Veil Guard. Can we expect to maybe hear your tones yes. within that game? Uh, I am not in that game, but I look very much forward to playing it. I have been in a lot of the other uh, Dragon Age games. Yeah. And, you know, it has such significant roles as Lyrium Merchant and uh, <laughs> Red Templar. Uh, but I did actually get to play a few uh, memorable characters in the franchise. Uh, in Dragon Age 2... I am uh, a, a prostitute named Jathan, and he works at uh, the Pearl, which is the Bordello. And I have it on good authority that everyone sleeps with Jathan. So uh. I, I recently, I was just at GameCon Canada uh, last weekend, and I did make the joke that I think Jathan has slept with more people than Commander Shepard, which is actually quite an achievement. Yeah, good Lord. What a feather in the cap for him. Oh, my mm. Lord. Um, so obviously many of you, many will know you as Commander Shepard, but you're also the Chaosium's Keeper of Arcane Law for the, their Call of Cthulhu series, which is fantastic, by the way. What draws you. you to tabletop role-playing games? What is it about that style of game that, that draws you in? Oh, uh, well, I mean, it's probably my origin as a person who pretends for a living. Uh, I was... <laughs> playing role-playing games long before I did any acting whatsoever. I went to school in a very small town in on the Canadian mm -hmm. prairies, so we did not have drama. We didn't have art uh, in, in high school anyway. There was no, no drama program, no art. Uh, and I'd been playing Dungeons & Dragons since I was in, oh God, the fifth grade. I think it was like 10 years old when I started playing that. Yeah. So yeah, it was the first, you know, experience i had doing voices uh, in front of an audience or or improvising really because when you, you are a dungeon master as i was uh any plan that you have goes out the window once it meets the player characters so Naturally. you you have to improvise narrative on the fly uh and so yes long before i i, I do a lot of improv now uh, as a you know theatrical improv but i hadn't unlike a lot of people i did not do it in school at all uh, and mm. Dungeons and Dragons was my creative outlet. Absolutely. And, and a great one. And then, 
And then, of course, on to many other role-playing games. Like back in the day, it was uh, the old Marvel superheroes role-playing game. I love that. Sure, yeah. And, yeah, the phase rip, uh, that old uh, system. And, uh, of course, uh, Call of Cthulhu, like, you know, way back in the, in the 80s. Uh, also, GURPS. I was very into GURPS for a while. And oh, eventually, yeah. by the 90s, uh, Vampire the Masquerade, like the original Vampire the Masquerade. These yep. were all things that I like to do. And, th- and again, this was before I was an actor. Yeah, beautiful. I mean, what great, you know, ground level experience to having to to play not just one character, but many if you're the dungeon master, which fits with my next question, which I know this is kind of a, mm, it's, it's maybe not a question you ask a tabletop fan, but do you have a preference between being a player or a dungeon master typically mm. in, in TTRPGs? Well, I would say because I think it's just because of uh, the way things went for me, I started playing when I was quite young and with mm-hmm. some older kids. And uh, so I was very into it at the point where they started to get out of it. Like some of some people moved away. Some people were just like, mm, I'm I'm going to go on dates now and not, <laughs> not spend my <laughs> weekends playing role playing games. Uh, so and again, I was younger than them. So I certainly had not by, you know, I haven't grown out of it now, but I had certainly had was not ready to lay it down then. Hmm. And I realized that the only way I could keep playing D&D was to learn how to be a DM then teach other people how to play Dungeons and Dragons. And that would be the only d d playing that I would get. So right. I was a forever DM for, for quite a while, a number of years, until one of my players eventually was like, oh, I'd like to run a campaign. And I was very grateful for that. Oh, thank play. God. <laughs> yes. Uh, though, uh, I mean, recently I've been, uh, I've been doing like a lot of game mastering and DMing, but for a number of years I was just doing drop-in so i would sometimes uh, i do a lot of travel for theater and things like that and uh work with improv companies a lot and the venn diagram of improvisers and nerds is sometimes (laughs) just a circle so often at a you know in whatever city i happen to be in at the local improv troupe there would be somebody who had like a regular D &D game and so i would drop into those and uh either npc or just you know bring in a character for a night uh so getting getting back it had been a while since i got to scratch the the d m itch uh, and in fact uh, to scratch that itch i started an improv show called improvised dungeons and dragons at rapid fire <laughs> theater here in edmonton uh and which is what it sounds like it was basically uh you know we'd have the characters all the people as the pcs in full costume uh Excellent. with all their props and weapons and everything like that i would be in some you know sort of a neutral black robe as the dungeon master and i would do everything a dungeon master does which is play all of the monsters and anyone else that they ran into the townspeople the person who gave them their mission their mentors the king whoever uh, and that was a lot of fun i started that back in 2010 and i subsequently got to do that uh at uh, festivals over in england i've done it uh, do it a lot at uh, dad's garage theater down in atlanta uh at uh conventions like dragon con we've done it at dragon con a number sure, of times yeah yeah and uh it it was fun but it was probably not until like all through the editions i've been the guy who buys the books to read them just for his own pleasure you know? like, <laughs> yeah like oh a new edition came out i think i'll buy that <laughs> and certainly when like in the three 3.5 era i was buying everything ravenloft related like all the gazetteers and you know third party yep. stuff anything I could get my hands on. Uh, and when fifth came out, I, I think, yeah, I do, I'm not sure if I got anything for fourth, but when, cause they didn't really do any Ravenloft stuff, but yeah. when fifth came out, I got right in on the ground floor with fifth again and just bought all the books and, uh, you know, got back into DMing and it has been fun. So I guess, yeah, I, I guess the, the very long answer to your question is these days I'm even Steven. I'm like, yo, Hey, DM, sure. DM, because I've got to do plenty of both recently. Uh, usually whatever I'm pining for is what I've got to do the least, you know, uh, if, if it go, if, if I'm, you know, stuck being the DM for a long time, it's like, oh, I really want to play. And if I'm just being a player for a long time, it's like, like be nice to run a campaign again so yeah it's a good spot to be in to be able to do Mm -hmm. both and to enjoy both because i know that a lot of a lot of dms probably secretly would love to be on the other side of the table um uh yeah i can i can guarantee that because uh i just as i mentioned i just did GameCon canada uh here uh, uh last weekend 
And I believe there was one of I, I did some public D and D games where people could uh, you know buy tickets and you know play mm-hmm. a, a one shot at my table. Uh, and there was at least one of my tables where everyone at the table was like, "Yeah, I'm the forever GM. Yeah, this is <laughs> this is the only way I'm going to get to uh, to play in a campaign." <laughs> Uh, so I was glad to provide that service for them. Absolutely, a noble, a noble, uh, a noble gesture, I would say. When you when you are the player, and I know this is kind of a nothing question because the the essence of D and D is that it changes every time. But do you have mm. a preferred race or class or multi class that you maybe don't go back to frequently, but you particularly enjoy RPing? Uh, I mean, I almost exclusively play spellcasters. Uh, given the choice, you know, sometimes when it's yep. just like, we've got a pre-gen, it's like, right, I'll be the rogue or whatever. But usually uh, if I'm creating my own character, I want to, I want to have spells. Uh, yep. And whether that's, you know, wizard, warlock, sorcerer, cleric, uh, somebody, somebody who's got a, a fairly, I know these days, everybody's got spells, but <laughs> yes, things that way. Yep. but yeah, but yeah, I do. I like the casters. I just like the casters. I tend to gravitate towards that. I tend to do that as well. My last character was uh, a dragonborn sorcerer, so I'm I'm very mm-hmm. much in that same sort of realm. Absolutely, there's just something, mm-hmm. yeah, something just wonderful about casting fireball and just obliterating a whole bunch of very <laughs> low level enemies. That just, yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, very satisfying. Absolutely. Um, so you'll be heading down, obviously, to Pax Oz in October, as we said, which has a pretty massive. Uh, it's as a pretty 50 50 split split between video games and tabletop games or board games Mm -hmm. during these sort of conventions like packs which side of the fence do you typically seem to lean towards because you've very much got a foot in both worlds in the video game and the tabletop scene so where do you usually spend most of your time in these sort of conventions uh i mean it usually depends on the organizers because they're the ones who usually decide my schedule you know so uh, but left to my own devices, I'll probably, yeah, I'd probably do the same, like split my time between, you know, and then there would be like, are there any comics anywhere? Does anyone, is there anyone bring some long boxes in the dealer room? Uh, I'm also a collector of stuff and, uh, I yep. enjoy cosplay and, and LARP and that sort of thing. So I'm often, uh, especially when I'm going a little further afield from where I usually am, uh, just hunting around in the dealer room to see if there's any unique props or, or things like that, that I can pick up for my collection. Well, fingers crossed. I mean, it's kind of a double-edged sword. I I hope that there are wonderful things for you to collect while you're down here, but also Mm. it's the tricky thing of then getting it home because it's not like you live just down the road. So hopefully you don't fall in love with some incredibly large sword that's going to cost you an absolute bomb in freight. Actually, the last time I was at, uh, I think I was in Australia for Oz Comic Con a few years ago. Uh, and I did actually find, I think it's, it's not here. It's on the other part of the wall behind me, but it's a uh, Thorin's sword, uh, Orcist. Uh, and I got a very good price for it and I had to <laughs> figure out how I was going to get it back. Cause I usually leave a little bit of space in my luggage. I know that I'm, there, it's likely I'm going to buy something. Uh, but it was just like, it was too long to even fit in the suitcase uh, even diagonally so yeah i had to negotiate to get that aboard uh <laughs> aboard the plane it's Good. like well it's clearly not you know it is a toy it's not actually sharp or anything and yeah and it's in a box so yes I oh, very i'm much... sorry there's, there's going to be a telephone ringing for a moment i forgot to mute that that is a okay i am um, i feel your pain with that i i was in la not that long ago uh and i went to galaxy's edge while i was there and obviously you know made mm-hmm. my own lightsaber so getting back yes. through tsa with a lightsaber you would think it would be a hard thing to do but all anyone wanted to do was ask me like what color did you go with what sort of you know <laughs> where did you enjoy your I, time it was wonderful you just meet nerds i i had exactly the same experience uh just last halloween because we went to uh uh galaxy's edge in orlando sure uh, at, yep. the, at the disney world resort and again i thought it was going to be a bit of an issue trying to get that back on the plane but it, you know we had a direct flight so it's like oh no flights from orlando we are used to this this yeah, is oh, yeah. standard yeah absolutely they'd be they'd see that day in day out there's no doubt um uh, i went i went with red by the way how about you I went with green. I'm a fan of the, I always loved growing up the Luke's second lightsaber from Return of the Jedi. I always cool. gravitated towards that. So yeah, I had to. Everyone I'm was afraid, going- I, Even though I have, uh, you know, uh, 
I already had a few red lightsabers. It was like, I got to go with Sith. Always go with Sith. Look, if that's where you're leaning on the scale, you just, you have to be true to yourself. I, I understand that. I absolutely. just like the Sith fashion sense. That's all. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I, I'm, I dress in all black pretty well all the time. So realistically, I should have gone red. <laughs> um, well, cause I know obviously TTRPGs are definitely your, your kind of bag. Have you ever ventured into social deduction games like werewolf or secret Hitler? Have you ever maybe tried, there's an Australian developed game called blood on the clock tower. I've, I've certainly played it. Oh, amazing. I, I only just, I I've recently, heard of. Yes. Yeah. I've recently played it myself for the first time and I think it might be one of the the greatest social deduction games I've I've ever played. So if you yeah if you haven't played it, a lot of the the time packs do they just cordon off a room, particularly for Blood on the Clock Tower. So not that you know I'm at all affiliated with the Pandemonium Institute, but if you do find <laughs> time, I would absolutely suggest getting around uh, Blood on the Clock Tower. But you have you've dabbled in social deduction oh. games. Yes, I've certainly played, like, you know, uh, Mafia and Werewolf at parties yes, and things yeah. like that. So, yes. Yeah, I do enjoy that. And uh, there are, like, RPGs out there that really break the mold in terms mm. of, uh, you know, the, the, some that, that don't involve any dice rolls, for example. Um, uh, particularly, I've enjoyed Alice is Missing. If you haven't had a chance to play that, I highly recommend it. Oh, no, Alice is Missing is a phenomenal game. You play it. Uh, you're, a lot of it is using your phone. It's just like you're getting texts sure. from yep. each other. And uh, yeah, uh, Spencer uh, Stark uh, developed that and it is great. I've had a, a couple of chances to play it on streams. And again, highly recommend. Uh, another one is, uh, I don't know if you've played 10 Candles by any chance. I've heard of, but I haven't, ha mm. I've not dabbled in it myself yet, but th uh, that's worth doing as well. I'm now, now I'm just getting Definitely. game suggestions from you. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Okay. Alice in Missing and Ten Candles. Put those at the top of your list. All right. I absolutely will. Because yeah, I've, I'm I'm in that sort of. You know how you you play one game and it tends to kind of spark. You want to find more of that sort of genre. That's very much where I'm at. So I'll take you up on those for sure. Yes. Oh, and Call of Cthulhu, of course. Naturally, I haven't. I've done mm. plenty of D and D, but Call of Cthulhu has has escaped me. What is there something in particular that draws you to Call of Cthulhu? Is it just that mythos, oh, yes. or something about well, the gameplay? Well, yes, the mythos and the lore, of course, uh, but also the fact that I mean, at, at its base, Dungeons and Dragons is basically a power fantasy. You're the hero. Yes. You're you've got all, lots of powers and cool fantasy pets and the griffin you ride on and all that sort of thing. Uh, in Call of Cthulhu, you're basically you're just meat for the mill. You're uh, you're a victim in a horror movie, and the yep. best that you can hope for is to escape without going too insane, or <laughs> you know, perhaps insane in a way that you can recover from, and maybe you'll have maybe you'll have all your body parts at the end of it. Uh, the yeah, so where a lot of RPGs are a power fantasy, it's a powerlessness fantasy. Sure, <laughs> and, of course, yeah. Well, I imagine that you'll you'll be getting lots of questions thrown at you uh, based on Call of Cthulhu when you come down this way. But for PAX mm -hmm. Oz, what is your schedule looking like? What can we expect to see you doing while you're down this way? That I believe is still under wraps because I'm no. not sure if it's actually if it's actually been decided. Uh, well, I'm Completely assuming. Completely fair. I one you know having done this sort of thing before, I assume that I will be doing some signing uh, yep. and. Uh, probably a few panels here and there, and I believe the, the topics of those have yet to be decided, or at least not communicated to me yet. <laughs> but uh, I think that, yes, hopefully I'll be doing some stuff with Chaosium, so uh, yep. hope that would probably mean, if our time at Gen Con has been any indication, uh, probably a game, a streaming game. Uh, sure. just that people can come and watch and perhaps I don't know if this is for sure yet but perhaps you might be able to play Call of Cthulhu with me at a ticketed event oh, I would definitely I would definitely be there for that absolutely having that I've not played it before what better way to, to jump in than with uh, the Keeper of the Law himself absolutely oh thank you well, we, we certainly look forward to seeing you when you do come down for PAX. Thank you so much for taking the time to to have a chat with me this morning for me, this afternoon for you. Uh, and I'll let you go to enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much, Mark. Thanks, Adam. Thanks.